Thank you. Uh -huh. And we are live. Hi, everyone, and thank you for tuning in today for the second night of the MSJC Political Science Club's uh, Southern California Community Town Hall. Um, my name is James. I will be uh, uh, the moderator uh, for tonight's event. Uh, and then with us, we have uh, board members uh, Rivera and board member Ashley. Uh, and so thank you both for being here as well um, and participating in this in this event. Um, I think, uh, I'm hoping, and I, I believe that students will get a lot out of this from watching it today, so thank you. Um, and then also um, a big thanks to Student Life and Development for helping support this event, helping get us um, all the procedural stuff through. And then also thank you to the um, MSJC Political Science Club uh, for, for you know, uh, building this up for, from the ground. Um, so um, real quickly, I'm gonna go over some of the rules uh, for uh, the event right now. So each speaker has been provided these questions ahead of time that um, we will be going over. Um, so they've had time to prepare their answers. They will each have two minutes uh, per answer. Um, and we have a timekeeper um, in, in the background who will be letting them know uh, via the chat um, when their time is coming up um, for, for that two minutes. Um, Obviously, at the end of the two minutes, we will have to cut the speaker off if, if they are still going. Um, and to since this is not a debate, right, this is more of a space for us to share ideas. Um, neither board member Rivera or board member Ashley is going to be allowed to um, essentially invoke each other's names, right? Uh, we want to uh, stay away from anything that might cause a, a disruption. Um, and also speakers are not allowed to interrupt one another. And I will also not interrupt them unless it's that two minute mark. Um, so those are sort of our rules, our parameters uh, for tonight. And then um, each question, uh, we will start with board member Ashley, and then we will go to board member Rivera, uh, just because of the alphabetical order it was the easiest way to do it. Um, so without further ado, uh, we will uh, jump into the event and get started. So um, our first question, uh, starting with board member Ashley, um, is in your position of leadership, how do you prioritize infrastructure problems at, on campus, such as roads, parking, and computers? Yes, um, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on. It's uh, always a pleasure to be here, and uh, I really have a lot of respect for the Political Science Club and the work they've done over the years. And, um, and with that, I would just start by answering that question that, um, that the, to keep in mind that the Board of Trustees is not a, um, you know, we we don't really prioritize every little thing. Uh, we're, we set the policy. We're a policy making board, a body. We put the people in leadership that we be, we believe can get the job done, and we evaluate the job they do. They so it's the the ab, the cabinet and the admin that would prioritize. You know, a parking structure over, let's say, some other project if needed. But that being said, we do have. Um, you know, we do have a facilities master plan that we follow. That master plan is reviewed every single year. Um, and we um, have some realities that have been kind of challenging. For example, student parking, uh, you know, there's a fee for student parking, that money is used to maintain the parking lot. So I've noticed when I've driven on campus um, recently that, you know, the parking lots look like they could use a fresh layer of asphalt and be kind of, um, touched up, but there's, you know, really limited money with no parking. So uh, that's, you know, an example of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a restraint. But, you know, I've always uh, looked at, I try to look at the very big picture and then give direction to, you know, give my input to the rest of the board. And if we all agree, then we would direct, uh, you know, Dr. Schultz to move in that direction. For example, you know, we, the largest amount of the population of our area is um, lives in Temecula and Murrieta, and we didn't have a campus in that area, and we were losing thousands and thousands of students who were clogging freeways, wasting fuel, uh, wasting time driving to Palomar College. So in that regard, I think my time is about up. Um, we prioritized, you know, like we need to do something in that area, but when we let uh, the college then move with the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Board member Rivera, same question to you. Um, if you would like, I can repeat the question as well. That's all right. Thank you, James. Uh, I would like to say first off, thank you to the Political Science Club for for facilitating this event, as well as Student Life and Development. Thank you for uh, 
<laughs> asking us to be here for today's evening. Uh, so first, I would like to also say that we are a policy level board, meaning that we set policies and authorize district leadership to prioritize and recommend changes, upgrades, in addition to address parking technology and any other needs identified by administration. With that being said, we have a facilities master plan, which is reviewed annually for system facility, systematic facility development. We use that system allocation model to ensure that we properly use our resources and keep consistent with the facilities master plan. Perfect, thank you. Uh, and thank you both for um, answering that question in, in such detail. Um, appreciate that. Um, so uh, moving on to our second question, um, again, uh, starting with board member Ashley. Um, what is the board currently anticipating in regards to class size um, and or class functionality as we transition back in person for the fall semester? Uh, this can be stuff like um, cap sizes on classes, sanitizing classes or, or the rooms in between classes, uh, masks, et cetera. Yeah, um, that's a great question. It's uh, something I think about all the time and I've uh, raised my, my opinions on, in open session on the, in several board meetings. Uh, my, my personal belief is uh, we need to have an aggressive reopening plan, but that has safe, you know, student and faculty and staff safety at the highest, um, at, in the highest priority. So we want to be aggressively reopened, but we want to have also very realistic plans to be able to quickly downsize if needed based on uh, local and state and federal regulations about PPE and about social distancing. So, but in regards to that, um, we have purchased uh, like huge amounts of things to make us safe. For example, air purifiers, they're very expensive. We got air purifiers. We have, um, uh, we got upgraded uh, air filtration in every, in every air conditioner in the, in the whole district. And um, uh, we also got um, fogging, you know, these fogging machines that kind of disinfect. So those are like three things we're doing. My personal belief is uh, we will reach a level of safety through vaccinations and, um, and I really want to open aggressively, but, but be ready to pull back if, uh, if, if needed, uh, if conditions on the ground don't allow it. Thank you for that. Um, same question to you, board member Rivera. Um, if you'd like, I can also repeat the question. That's okay, thank you. So we are currently planning a robust return to campus, meaning that our return will be scalable, but contingent upon public health guidelines. As of now, we are returning with 50% class sizes, but in this rapidly changing environment, that could change depending on what rules are in effect. Sanitizing between classes will take place. Safety is our priority. Know that we are going to do the best, uh, do our best. We have fogging machines, we have air purifiers, and new air filters. We will, be, we will have PPE for our students upon their return as our students' safety is our priority. Thank you for that. Um, and now sort of building off of um, this last question, um, our third question is, um, as we start to transition back into person, Will the necessary PPE, right, that's masks, hand sanitizer, et cetera, be provided to students at MSJC for no cost? Or is this an expected expenditure on, on the part of students, such as a textbook would be? Um, yes. Uh, first of all, yes, we will be providing um, things like um, alcohol sanitizing for your hands. Um, I believe... Uh, Dr. McAllister, who's our like the lead nurse for all of our student health centers. And I'll back up a little and say, doesn't it look wise that we did create uh, student health centers at every campus uh, right before this happened? It's going to be, a, it's a huge benefit for the students and staff as we return to have uh, that infrastructure in place. And Dr. McAllister is going to be providing like a, like a I guess you could call it a welcome back, um, like bag for students that has alcohol sanitizers sanitizers, excuse me, and really nice masks with the MSJC logo on them and uh, other things. And uh, we'll have uh, additional PPE uh, available to students as needed um, on the campuses. So I'm very happy about that. And um, um, 
also sanitizing will take place between classes, which is awesome, but it also provides kind of a, a challenge of, uh, you know, how often can you run a normal schedule throughout the day? You know, if there's normally a class from 10 to 1050 and then 11 to 1150, for example, 10 minutes isn't really enough time to get everyone out and sanitize the room. So it is gonna create a, um, like a facilities challenge but we um, do have the Temecula campus ready to open. So with the new campus and our existing campuses, I think we're gonna be in pretty good shape. Thank you for that, uh, board member Ashley. Um, and uh, same question to you now, uh, board member Rivera. And if you'd like, I can, I can repeat. It's okay, thank you. So yes, again, <laughs> our safety, uh, the safety of our staff, students and faculty is our priority. The district currently has a supply of masks hand sanitizer and other PPE available for our students who will need them at no cost. We will be providing a welcome back packet to our students, which will have the necessary PPE, mask, hand sanitizer, and other safety and cleaning supplies. Uh, and again, like my colleague said that, remember, we're gonna be cleaning and sanitizing between classes. So again, priority, safety is our priority. Awesome, thank you. Um, so uh, again, kind of building off of how we're doing this transition back into person, um, our fourth question, uh, and we will start with board member Ashley, um, is how does the board envision effective learning as we transition back into in-person? Um, well, so first of all, I don't see it as the board, I guess it's a, it's okay for the board to envision effective learning, right? But it's really not uh, our job to oversee our awesome faculty and how they teach. So um, we would expect, you know, if a faculty member is not doing their job, that you know that you know we'll work with them to give them support to to improve, and uh, and also give props to the amazing staff that we already have uh, to for learning. But in addition to that, I would say, especially considering I'm, I'm a high school teacher and a technology coach, uh, that's my day job. And um, what I'm seeing is faculty and teachers are learning massive amounts of new techniques, new tricks, and uh, they're getting far better at Canvas and other uh, learning um, management tools and, and platforms. And my guess is that when we all get back, the faculty will be much more efficient at at managing their class so that there'll be more time for just awesome discussions that are always my favorite thing to have really deep discussions and close readings of material. And, and I think, you know, we'll have more time for things like that when we get back. So I envision um, that this experience will like, we'll be rusty. Well, we'll lose our voices at first, you know, cause we're not used to talking all the time, but we'll get those voices back and we'll, um, I think we'll be better than ever, to be honest with you, after we get the, you know, we get the creeks out. Thank you. Uh, same question to you now, board member Rivera. Thank you. So again, um, just like my colleague said, we are a policy level board. The classroom and learning environment is our faculty's domain. I have the most respect for our faculty and know that they are there to ensure effective learning takes place within our classrooms. So we have to look at striking a balance between innovation that took place in relation to technology over the past year, along with our students' adaptability for online, hybrid, and in-person classes. Thank you. Um, and so our, our next question is sort of moving away um, from, from COVID restrictions um, and that transition back. But um, so uh, board member Ash, uh, to both of you, but starting with board member Ashley. Um, some, some students believe that there is a gap in communication between MSJC and the student population. Um, do, do you think that is the case? And if so, how does MSJC plan on restoring that gap um, in communication? Mm -hmm. um, so, so first of all, effective communication is a, it's um, obviously it's never perfect. Ever, it's what you might call, you know, it's some people have a chronic condition. You never, um, you'll never be completely healed from it, but you can manage it. And I think like when it comes to effective communications, especially during COVID, um, it was, it, it's anticipated that, com, you know, effective communication is gonna be um, more of a challenge than it, than it would be when you have all your faculty in the class and they can all keep 
telling students over and over again throughout their classes, like what, you know, some important event that's coming up or deadlines. Um, I, with that said, though, I'm really proud. I, I know that uh, Karen Marriott, who's um, our, uh, she's a the director of communications in the president's office. I know she's done a survey of, to students about like how they prefer to be communicated with. And we've actually run with some of those like, okay, which social media platform? And from what I've heard, she found out that students actually enjoy direct mail, like getting a nice piece of cardstock that says, this is the deadline for this. And, you know, classes are available now. Here's a link to the you know, the course catalog. And so we're looking at that. But I, what I would just say is, um, I know that, I mean, I know I've seen, because I get a lot of the emails that all of you get, I've seen a lot of, um, I would consider effective uh, um, YouTube videos from the president and a lot of emails, but I, I know we can do better. And if uh, there's something, some specific, you know, my ears are always open to bring concerns uh, to the president. Thank you. Um same question to you now, Ms. Uh, board Member Rivera. Thank you. Well, to tell you the truth, I feel the communication between MSJC and the students is being managed the best we can in this difficult time. I see the constant stream of information being sent out by MSJC from our presidents via email and social media. We are reimagining communications and looking to offer direct mail opportunities to our students. In addition, our staff sends out media preference surveys to make sure we are providing communication via mediums mediums that are most desired by our students. On a personal level, I understand the anxiety that comes with communication currently. We are always looking to improve our communication. And again, we do encourage feedback. Thank you. Uh, so our, our next question then, um, and starting with board member Ashley. Um, so according to the uh, MSJC's 2019 to 2020 budget, um, there was Nine, uh, $906,154 allocated to buildings, um, but in the 20 to 21 uh, budget, uh, this increased quite a bit to um, a little over 13 million uh, uh, allocated. What project required this, this increase in funding? Okay, uh, so first of all, uh, we, uh, we, we got a, a lot of feedback and I agree with it completely uh, that the San Jacinto campus uh, was really in need of some TLC, some tender loving care and, and more. It, it's um, our oldest campus and it, it has a lot of kind of buildings that are older and, and more run down. And there was a lot of staff and uh, faculty that brought that to our attention. And uh, so monies that traditionally uh, the state would pay for things like deferred maintenance had dried up. So we just made a decision to put a lot of money into the San Jacinto campus so most of that money is going to the San Jacinto campus. Um, for example, the current 200 building is going to be made into a student uh, center, uh, you know, and it's going to be like re remodeled. And so that's one example of, you know, the things we're going to do, but basically that's it. That's why we, that's why you see that difference there. Thank you. Um, same question to you now, uh, board member Rivera. Sure, thank you. So uh, again, I'm gonna have to agree with our, my colleague stating that <laughs> uh, San Jacinto campus, it, we're looking towards the phase one renovations. So the difference in between the, our last year's budget and this year's budget is where we're focusing and reallocating resources to improve our San Jacinto campus. Uh, again, one of the examples is the 200 and turning that into a student service center, trying to make that a one-stop hub for our students on that campus. We're trying to add additional square feet to make it, uh, again, a viable solution for our students. So yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, so um, next question, uh, and obviously we're, we're starting with board member Ashley. Um, as a board member, how can you best address campus safety with regards to lockdowns um, and even harassment of MSJC students by other MSJC students or non-MSJC people, members of the community, et cetera? Uh, well, yes. And so um, let me start with uh, policing because uh, uh, it seems like there's kind of two parts to it. Like lockdowns would be like campus emergency and whatnot. Um, you know, our campus years and years ago had a, we had our own police force many years ago, uh, seven years ago. 
and we we voted to um, disband our police force and and uh, contract with the Riverside County Sheriff, which is a um, uh, in my opinion, a much more professional uh, outfit. And they they could provide support in every way imaginable immediately, unlike our old police force, right? They have helicopters and trauma units and uh, special uh, tactical teams if needed. And uh, proof that that move was, um, you know, it was terrifying for our San Jacinto students, but proof that it was a good move was how quick uh, our sheriffs responded when a when a, a man who was a uh, a student or a former student uh, came on campus with a gun and waved it around. Didn't shoot anybody or, or discharge his weapon, but uh, it was terrifying. And uh, because of that quick reaction, uh, we were able to uh, coordinate with other agencies and literally pull that man off of a plane that was about to leave for a foreign country, like two five minutes more of getting, uh, trying to find him, it might have been the difference between him getting away and not. So uh, for lockdowns, I, I'll leave it with that. And uh, um, and you know what, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Maybe I'll let Josh talk more, uh, you know, go into more detail then about, um, um, you know, free speech issues versus um, har- what, what constitutes harassment, right? Uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's a, it's, it, is a, a, it is a fine line. Free speech is uncomfortable sometimes. Um, and I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, board member Rivera, same question for you. Thank you. So as a board member and former student of MSJC, I take these matters seriously. I believe we can take action and work with our sheriffs to strike a balance regarding safety and security to ensure that policies and commitments are in place to keep our students safe and secure. Training for all our staff regarding campus safety is a priority. I know we currently have moderators for all our online events and spaces, so our students are not subject to harassment. So at the moment, that is what we're looking at. (laughs) That's where I'm at. Thank you. Um, So our next question, um, and again, starting with board member Ashley. um, So The construction of success is typically regarded as having a high GPA. Uh, Do you think that this can sometimes become a systemic barrier for some uh, students or some groups of of people within our institution? Um, If so, what actions have been taken or can be taken uh, to combat these systemic barriers? Yes, and I I noticed that you used an example of the 2.5 GPA for student government um, leadership and uh, so I'll, I'll like start with that example, um, which is um, uh, that that club is controlled by student government. So if uh, the student government would like to rewrite their their bylaws and their constitution to allow a lower GPA, that is outside the board of trustees realm. Like they could do that. Um, now you know we have a student trustee um, on the board, and uh, the we follow a state guideline that they must have at least a 2.0 GPA. And now one reason that it, you know, one reason that is important is uh, we've had a situation in the past where um, a student trustee, for example, didn't maintain the 2.0. They weren't being successful at school and like really success success in passing courses is really number one in my view. Like uh, I love for people to get involved because sometimes getting involved is what makes you bring up your GPA, but uh, there is kind of like a, there's a dog and there's a tail and you know the dog is meeting your educational goals like you set goals for yourself I'm going to get you know I'm become a nurse or I'm going to transfer with an AA off to San Marcos like that's really number one that's the dog clubs are so important but that's an to me uh, that is somewhat somewhat secondary you know if you're flunking out but you're having a great time in S- SGA. I'm, I don't feel like we're doing a good job. Um, but that being said, we have done things to, um, to make success much more attainable for students. And the biggest thing we've done, I don't, and you guys haven't been here long enough, but it wasn't that long ago that if you were um, had trouble with math, you would have to take three remedial math classes before you could take college algebra. And uh, that just, that was a massive, um, block to students. So, and I'll stop right there because I see my time is up. 
And we we did we did away with that, and we made it to you just need to take a single remedial course before going on to college algebra. Thank you. Um, same question to you now, uh, board member Rivera. Gotcha. So I just want to get this point across. Students can be engaged in varying levels of clubs throughout their time at MSJC. But the thing is, you are a student first, meaning that academics are priority. As far as removing, removing systematic barriers, MSJC has taken steps already to remove all the remedial courses. So students can jump right into college level courses without having to spend semesters in those remedial course, courses such as math as my colleague was talking about and English courses. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so our, our next question, um, how does MSJC plan on addressing equal representation uh, for all students and faculty members? And uh, that question will we'll first go to board member Ashley. Okay, um, I think it's a great question. It, it's something that is related to the final question. I know there's a question um, also about our equity pledge and it's to me very much related. And um, we've been working very hard. Um, uh, the other trustee that I will not name uh, per the rules, so we both uh, just voted yes on a new, uh, very uh, uh, re renovated participatory process that is really clear on how all groups, and I think all groups can uh, share in decision-making processes on campus. And I'm very proud of that. And um, we've had, uh, we've been working with uh, human resources and, uh, and other groups to develop a mentorship program to help um, uh, support uh, students of color and students from uh, uh, groups that sometimes are, are um, disadvantaged because of uh, their, their views or the, how they, um, who they are. So um, one area that we're doing quite well, uh, we have a disproportionate number of African-American uh, staff and faculty in relation to the number of African-American students um, at MSJC. So I'm, I'm proud of that, but an area that we need to work on is that we can't say the same thing about our, our Lat Latino, Latina professors. Uh, we could do better in that regard. And that's an area where, you know, I'm serious of that we need to improve. Thank you. Uh, same question to you now, uh, board member Rivera. Thank you. So um, similar to what my colleague said, there are a few ways we are addressing this through a robust participatory process where students, faculty, classified professionals and administrators work collaboratively. Uh, we did this up we did this by updating and approving a new participatory governance structure, also being committed to representation and inclusiveness, aggressively updating our hiring process and making efforts to remove systematic barriers in process. Thank you for that. Um, and it seems like this went by sort of fast, but we are at our final question. Um, so uh, uh, again, starting uh, with board member Ashley, um, our final question is the 2019 MSJC Equity Pledge emphasizes our values and goals as a college. What are the action plans for achieving this equity outlined in the Equity Pledge? Uh, how has the Equity Pledge impacted student life on campus thus far? Okay, well, so uh, I know that uh, many of you and I am watching, uh, uh, keeping abreast of the uh, the trial of the police officer that killed George Floyd. Um, that happened while we were already gone uh, off of campus. Um, so the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, you know, uh, was in full in full swing over the summer in rep in you know in reaction to that. And now you see, uh, uh, tragically, we're right in the same boat again. Uh, with another killing by a police officer of a of a black man in Minnesota, and it's uh, it's tragic. And uh, in response to that, though, our board voted five to zero to to put together an equity pledge that has eight really strong components um, that are actionable items. It's not just a pledge. Um, we've changed around. Like when we have new policies, we have to match how that policy meets our equity pledge, and. Um, and I will go on and say we've um, uh, we've also updated our hiring process because we really weren't getting the diverse applicants that we 
we felt that we needed. And, uh, you know, when you hire somebody, um, you know, good, good or bad, if they get tenure, they're with you for, you know, a very long time. And, you know, most of our faculty are very good. And, uh, and, but we, we don't really appear, we don't look like our community um, in, it just seems uh, we need to do better. And, um, and we have uh, done new job announcements with new commitments to equity on the announcement. And we have new interview questions where we specifically ask potential candidates questions about equity um, as part of the formal interview process. I'm pretty proud of that. Thank you. Um, and then uh, our final question as well to uh, board member Rivera. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, the action plan for achieving equity is multi-pronged. First, our call to action focuses on eliminating systematic racism through eight core action. Those actionable steps, as uh, my colleague referred to, uh, our strategic equity plan outlines strategies and uh, in interventions to improve success for our highest priority students. Our new core competencies focus on institutional learning outcomes focused on equity and cultural competency. We have added a new degree in social justice. We have extensive and robust professional development and training for all our staff and faculty. And again, we have also updated our hiring and recruitment process to improve the diversity in our hiring pools. Thank you. Um, and so we are, we have finished our questions for uh, this evening. Um, but before we finish up, I do wanna give um, each board member a chance, right, another two minutes to any closing thoughts, any, anything that maybe wasn't addressed in the questions or that um, you, you kind of ran out of time with or anything as a, as a whole. So um, again, uh, board member Ashley, you will have your two minutes now to uh, close out any last thoughts. Um, well, everyone, I would just, uh... We've been through something that we'll all remember for the rest of our lives. This pandemic has fundamentally changed our, our lives, uh, mostly for the worse. Uh, and, um, you know, I've, I've known people who've passed away and I've known people that got so sick that we thought they were gonna pass away. And I would, or I would like to tell everyone like the pandemic is a horrible reality. It's not made up. And that we have, thanks to modern, science. We have super effective vaccines. I would um, plead with you to talk to your healthcare professional. If you are hesitant to get the vaccination, please talk to your healthcare professional um, and reconsider getting the vaccination as soon as possible. Um, I got the Moderna and, uh, and my second shot. And then secondly, I'd like to reiterate my belief that Black lives do matter. And, uh, um, and I stand with uh, people of color at the campus and uh, in the United States and around the world. Thanks. Thank you for that board member, Ashley. Um, and uh, now board member Rivera, uh, two minutes to close out any, any last minute thoughts. Most definitely. Well, I wanna say thank you to our political science club and student life and development for again, putting on this event and facilitating it. Thank you to James as our moderator. Um, I appreciate that. I appreciate the student body coming to us with these questions. I know we are coming into the latter half of our semester. So I wanna wish all of our students, good luck. You're almost at the finish, keep going. This has been a tough, some semester like all semesters are but you're almost there so we support you reach out with communication if you have anything for us we are here and we are here to listen so i, I want to say again i appreciate this evening and again go eagles <laughs> thank you board member rivera um and with that uh we are uh uh, now finished with tonight's event, um, I want to, again, uh, reiterate uh, my thanks and uh, the Political Science Club's thanks to uh, both board member Ashley and board member Rivera for their participation uh, tonight. Um, uh, it, it does mean a lot to the student body to, to see you both here and answering these questions. So thank you. Um, and again, thank you to Student Life and Development and the rest of the Political Science Club uh, who have really um, supported, motivated, and, and built uh, tonight's event. So thank you. Um, and I hope everyone who is watching from home, car, wherever you may be, uh, that you have a great rest of your night. Thank you. <laughs>